Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Chris Lydon, who is in India and uh, one of the first to start podcasts, if not the first. We say the first. You say the first. With another guy who is doing the thinking, you know. The, and the, the technology thinking. of it. You know, a podcast seems to be something quite simple to do. How is it that you people were the first to get this idea? And what made you come to podcast? So we had to find something. I had actually been fired from my last job doing public radio because we wanted an ownership piece of, of what we had invented, what we were doing. And they said, no way, you're fired. So uh, I said, I better study the, the web, uh, the new technology. So and radio I, means that you were doing actual proper radio shows. Yeah, a regular show. And I'd done a, a television show before that. I'd done New York Times political reporting before that, uh, local Boston political reporting before that. Um, but I had done a number of media and I thought, wow, I better figure this thing out. And then a guy came <clears throat> who really understood it, a programmer, Dave Weiner, and uh, he came to this Berkman Center at Harvard where I was trying to learn the game, and he said, um, I wrote to him and I said, yesterday I couldn't spell blog, tomorrow I want to be one, you know? Um, and he said, we'll do it. And he said, you understand radio, I understand syndication programming. What the world needs, he said, is an MP3 file that can be circulated on the web. On the web and to a subscription list. And uh, it took a month or two and we figured it out. And he sa I, I said, now what do we do? And he said, you're gonna interview me. That's, that's the first thing, so I did. And then I started uh, interviewing all sorts of people, especially the people who were remaking media. So basically an MP3 player being able to be downloaded and put, put into a website. Put it, and, and mailed. Mail to people. Like you'd mail a document. Okay. But there was a funny, important other piece of this, uh, Prabir. Um, the political connection. For me, it was all about the Iraq War. The end of 2002, 2003, we knew a war was coming. And we knew it was going to be crazy. And we knew that all the established legacy media uh, were going to be for it. I, I don't know why, but the New York Times, considered to be experienced, enlightened papers, the Washington Post, the New Yorker Magazine, our own Boston Globe, and they just jumped on the bandwagon of this idiotic war. And I said, said, no, God gave us the internet to fight back and to try to stop it. And um, we couldn't stop it, as it turned out. But um, you know, those worldwide demonstrations uh, in February, February 15th, 2003, and I went to New York, and we discovered that uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg had blocked off all the streets of the east side so that the demonstrators could not get, like me, ordinary bourgeois Americans couldn't get to the United Nations to protest. And the New York Times barely covered the story. But we realized that suddenly, no, there, there is an old order of things, including media, that wants this war, and, and we're, gonna have to, we're gonna have to remake media. And along comes the web, and that's, that's the process that we're still working on, I think, is to reinvent a modern media that lets... Uh, Democratizes yes, communication yes, in some way. Exactly. You know, it's interesting you say that because I was in the U.S. at that time just before the Iraq war was being declared, mm. probably three to five months before that. And I came back and told my friends, the U.S. is going to attack Iraq. They said, why are you saying that? Because there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Everybody knows it. Mm. Why would they do it? I said, because not any media house in the United States is willing to carry the story that fundamentally there may not be any WMDs in Iraq. All of them are saying there are WMDs in Iraq. The only question is when will Saddam Hussein own up to it? And if they don't, then we have to take it out. Right. So, you know, this, this whole discourse had been set. When is Saddam going to declare? And if he doesn't, when, how do we take the WMDs right. out of Iraq? Right. So this media discourse, as you were saying, com convinced me that the Iraq war was coming, in spite of the fact that most people in India, including the elite, including media observers, right. did not believe it. Well, and then Tony Blair signed on. That was, uh, for me, uh, he is the one person in the world who could have said to George Bush, we have been to Iraq in the 20s, we made a mess of it, the imperial order is broken, is over, we're not going with you and we'll fight against it. If he had said that, I think the war could have been stopped. But in, in fact, it became this great moment when the United States took on the grand role of what was you know, the tattered memory of the British Empire, you know, we go places, um, and uh, on it went. But 
the strange part for me, and we, we, we could get into this, is um, that American media, the legacy media, the old media, conventional print, but also the old owners, still have not realized that they're responsible for that war. The people understand it. And that's part of the reason why Donald Trump can say the failing New York Times. He doesn't go on, but people know that they were wrong on uh, the disaster of our modern place in the world, including the torture, including, you know, now the, 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 the drone war. We were good guys in World War II. We're now the monsters with these air attacks, um, killing vast numbers of civilians, and we don't care. We don't know the people, and we don't even get our facts straight. Colin Powell goes to the United Nations and says, this is what we're doing and why, because all cooked up bad evidence. I mean, it's become a nightmare, and the old media, to a great degree, has not said, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, Chris, that's the other part which surprises me sitting in India, that a media which disgraced itself during the Iraq war mm. by supporting something which they knew was wrong. And now when it says the same thing again and again, that you have Syria, chemical weapons, you have X, you have Russia, Ukraine, right. you name it, the story goes on. Right. And they seem to have remade the consensus which might have broken during the Iraq war or post Iraq war that there was something wrong with what the Iraq war evidence was. But they seem to have remade it in a way that A, the media is today completely convinced that they need a war with Russia, both sides nuclear weapons. They believe they need mm. to have regime changes all over the world. You have a huge number of now uh, commandos in Africa, which comes out occasionally when there is a, a disaster and some yeah. people get yeah. killed, some other commandos get killed. So how is it that the old media which should have said uh, at least a confess to their complicity in the war, how is it they still have become not only, shall we say, carrying the government propaganda, but actually wanting a war and a nuclear weapon? Uh, I don't know. Some people think weapons the weapons. Democratic Party, including Hillary Clinton, that, that generation wants a war with Russia. I can't imagine why, uh, but they have not renounced. We don't talk peace in the United States anymore. We don't, we don't, that is not a, a goal. And... It mystifies me. I think at a popular level, I think there's a tremendous uh, anger about this. You know, those so-called red states, and particularly the counties in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, people like, places like that, uh, that for economic reasons, party reasons, should vote Democratic. They voted for Trump, and it's been very carefully documented that the counties that lost most men to those wars, Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East wars, uh, those are the ones that turned for Trump. I mean, like, get us out of this war, the, this, this kind of what they call the forever war, the eternal war, endless war. Um, I think the people know better, and I, I think sooner or later um, it'll break through. But meantime, meantime we have the story. I, I just want to say um, I am amazed, Prabir, at what is going on in India with new media. Not only the, um, the digitization of popular media, but specifically podcasting. I mean, uh, I'm talking about um, uh, News Click, but also The Wire, also Scroll, also what the BBC is doing with podcasts, also what our friend Abhinandan is doing at the News Laundry. Um, you are putting together sort of um, assorted independent voices on these new platforms. So it's not just one voice like mine, but it's a whole, it's a whole magazine full of interesting, independent, non-commercial, non-sponsored, not uh, imperial uh, voices that I, I think are gonna transform your world. And I wanna get in on it. I wanna figure out what you're doing and how we can do it in America. We don't have, we have some. Uh, Huffington Post looked like a site for independent writers, but then it became very commercial and made tons of money and got sold. Um, there are things like Jacobin Magazine, others that do good it's reporting. Alternet is, is, is Alternet there. Alternet is good. There are a lot of... A lot Black of, Agenda Report. Some Truth Dig. I mean, there, there are goodly numbers of them. But to put... My dream would be to put together a portfolio of uh, conversation, commentary on... Not, not an infinite number, but say, start with 
We'll get to politics later, but music, for example. People love to talk about music. Something I've learned in doing radio. When people talk about music, they're really talking their religion. It's, it's a sort of religion one step removed. In um, India, it would be football as well, yeah, or cricket. <laughs> exactly, or, and sometimes food. But literature, books, science, we live in a, in a really a world capital of medical science, computer science, um, genetic editing in Boston, Harvard, MIT, some of the most advanced work, and nobody covers it. Nobody knows how to cover it. Artificial intelligence, which uh, may absolutely. change or destroy our world, both. Exactly, exactly. Because and we're now done putting some of that. artificial intelligence into weapon systems, which but I think is a big danger. To get a podcast conversation going on that with people who know something and make it intelligible uh, for people who don't know it, I, I, this is my new ambition. I'd like to have a, a sort of a, a, whole, uh, a whole grab bag uh, of subjects on which the best conversation is on our site. And it would be interesting, I think, to you. I want to get Indian voices, Indian thinking. The next time we even think of going to war, we've got to talk to India. You guys won't get a vote. But, but you, so you said, who, maybe you get a veto. I, I have been always arguing since U.S. president effectively becomes the most important or the powerful person in the world, you guys can elect the president, but the rest <laughs> of the world should have a veto. Okay, uh, uh, <laughs> otherwise we are all endangered by your president. We can work it out sometime later. As long as the United States recognizes that its exceptionalism is actually endangering the whole world, not just the United States. Mm -hmm. If you continue with mm -hmm. climate change, it endangers yeah. all of us. If you continue with the kind of nuclear brinkmanship that the U.S. is doing right now with Russia, you are really uh, endangering the world in ways which you end humanity. And it's also interesting, the first time the media by and large has said there should have been no summit at all. Now this is that you don't want to even talk to another nuclear armed state is mm. amazing to me. Of course, mm. India and Pakistan are not behaving much better on that, but that apart, mm. you know. The question is that this tone of the media, that no talk, mm. and uh, we should take out uh, Russians with, what is it, cyber weapons. This is the kind of uh, madness that is being talked about. But coming back to right. the other, well, other Israel issue. Israel and the Saudis should take out Iran with, with uh, uh, you know, uh, hacking, in, super hacking. Super hacking and with U.S. troops. Let's be also clear. Well, no, U.S. missiles and God knows where the troops will come from. But the United States won't send troops for that. Troops, yes. Uh, you see, Saudis like to fight with mercenary troops. That's what they're doing in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a huge, shall we say, blot on us, civilizational ethos that you have a country today in which one million people are affected with cholera, you have destroyed their complete uh, water and sewage systems, and there is no voice in the world against it because the world media doesn't see it as an issue with 20 million people at the risk of starvation and death. So I think there's something wrong with the world that we are in and the voices that we are able to raise.